Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's my great honor tonight to introduce to you the first World Space Award recipient. Our World Space Award is presented, to, uh, presented for an outstanding contribution in space science, space technology, space medicine, space law, or space management. <coughs> its owner's work that has made an exceptional impact on the world progress in astronautics. This year, the IF has pro proudly selected the first recipient, Dr. Edo C. Stone for his extraordinary legacy of the achievement in space science exploration, his experimentation and the instrument development spanning the space age from its inception until the present, as you know. Dr. Stone, as you all will know, is a pioneering leader and <coughs> inspirational figure in the field of the space science. Dr. Stone became a well-known public figure through his work with NASA on the Voyager spacecraft and has since been principal investigator on nine NASA space missions. Professor of the physics at the, the California Institute of Technology and former director of the NASA, that I'm delighted to be able to welcome him to the podium. Dr. Stone, the floor. Um, uh, thank you. It's really, uh, it's really a bit of an extraordinary journey, and the nice thing about it, it's not over. Uh, we have, uh, <laughs> it's uh, just uh, one of these missions that keeps on giving. Uh, and as a scientist, that's all you know, the, that's the whole point, is to see things that uh, no one's seen before. And certainly Voyager has done that for us time and time again. Uh, it already got its start back in 1965, uh, when Gary Flandreau, who was a Caltech graduate student in aeronautics, was working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which Caltech runs for NASA. Uh, and his, uh, his assignment was to look for opportunities to take advantage of the swing by a planet and use the orbital motion of the planet to gravitationally slingshot uh, a, uh, a, a uh, spacecraft on its way and speeding it up. And he was he noticed that in nine, if, we, if we launched a spacecraft in 1977, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune were all lined up in a way that a single spacecraft could fly by all four. This is an opportunity that happens only once every 176 years. Uh, and it became known as the Grand Tour. Uh, and that was, that was the origin of uh, the Voyager mission, which turned out not to be started as a Grand Tour, because that seemed to be too ambitious. It started as just a four-year mission to Saturn, uh, with everything else uh, being a bonus. Uh, having succeeded at Saturn, we go on to Uranus. Having succeeded at Uranus, we go on to Neptune, and having succeeded at that, we, uh, we started in 1990 on our interstellar mission. So you can see the flybys, uh, Voyager 1 flying by Jupiter in uh, 1979, and then Saturn in 1980. Uh, and since Saturn was inclined, ring plane was inclined like this when Voyager flew by, it flew by behind the rings and ended up heading northward out of the plane of the planets. No further planetary encounters were possible. If Voyager 1 had not succeeded at Saturn, Voyager 2 would have done the same thing and there would not have been Uranus and Neptune. But Voyager 1 did work at Saturn. That allowed us to leave Voyager 2 in the plane of the planets and to, in fact, complete the grand tour, uh, heading on to Uranus and finally Neptune in 1989. And at Neptune, we wanted to see its moon Triton, which was in, in an inclined plane down behind the planet, so we had to fly over the North Pole, very close, the closest planetary encounter we had, and down to an encounter with its moon called Triton, and that sent Voyager 2 southward. So that's the beginning of the interstellar mission, was 1990, after the successful Voyager 2 flyby 
uh, in August of 1989. This is the spacecraft. The dig dish antenna always points at the Earth. Uh, it's a 3.6 meter antenna. You see the long boom uh, that's, uh, that is here. There it is. This is the magnetometer boom, a 13 meter boom. There's a magnetometer here and there so that one can uh, correct for the effects of the spacecraft. Uh, the two antennas over here are used by the plasma wave instrument, which I will mention uh, later in the talk. Uh, and the uh, other three instruments, which are currently part of the interstellar mission, are here. Uh, there's the plasma instrument, which is working on Voyager 2, unfortunately not on Voyager 1, and that will be part of the story today as well. Then there's the low-energy charged particle experiment. Tom Prometheus is here at the conference. He designed this instrument many years ago, uh, and uh, is, uh, like me, is still around working on the data. Uh, and not only that, but this, this instrument has a stepping motor, which now has made six million steps in the last 36 years. That must be some kind of a record for a mechanical system in space. And then there's the cosmic ray instrument, which is the one I'm responsible for, which looks at the highest energy particles. Uh, the other instruments up here on the scan platform were the ones which we used during the, uh, uh, during the planetary flybys. Part of the longevity of this mission is this power source, which is right here, three RTGs, radioisotope thermoelectric generators. The natural radioactive decay of plutonium-238 creates heat, and thermal couples convert that heat into electricity, a very simple, robust, long-lived power supply because the half-life of the 238 is 88 years. So that's part of the reason Voyager is still uh, still sending back signals uh, to us every day, 24 hours a day, uh, every day of the year. Uh, here are the, the five teams that are part of the interstellar mission. The, the plasma science, as I said, is working on Voyager 2 only, and we're looking forward to its uh, entering interstellar space in the years ahead. Uh, the low energy charged particle instrument, which Tom Provegis and his team uh, uh, use, uh, and the cause of instrument that I mentioned, uh, the magnetometer, which is Norm Ness and uh, John Burnett and Bill Kurt, plasma waves. So those are the five teams that have been part of and are continuing to be part of the mission. Well, this was Jupiter. Uh, and it, all the, I mean, I could give a lecture uh, on each one of these bodies, so I'm not going to do that. All I'm going to say is before Voyager, the only known active volcanoes in the solar system were here on Earth. And then we flew by this moon, Io, with 10 times the volcanic activity of Earth. And we realized right away that what I call our cent terracentric view of the solar system was much too limited, that time after time, uh, our view of the solar system had to be greatly expanded as we, uh, as we progressed out. Here's Saturn with its wonderful ring system where all the features you see, many of the features you see, are the result of moons creating wakes in the rings. Before Voyager, the only known nitrogen atmosphere in the solar system is right here on Earth. And then there's Titan, a, a planet-sized moon with an atmosphere much denser uh, than the Earth's of course, much colder, and with liquid natural gas, methane, uh, raining down on its surface. On to Neph on Uranus, which is tipped on its side, its pole is uh, sort of right here, it's, uh, the rotational axis is right there. Again, before Voyager, all the planetary magnetic fields had their poles near the, the rotational axis of the planet. That's the reason the compass is useful. Ah, guess what happened here? The pole is actually closer to the equator. <coughs> Than the, than the rotation axis, as is the case for Neptune as well. On to Neptune, only one ten, only a thousandth of the amount of energy to drive winds, and yet winds which are four or five times faster than those here on Earth. Again, a counterintuitive result. Uh, and uh, before Voyager, the only known active guide, the geysers in the solar system were right here on Earth. And then we flew by this little moon called Triton, which is a twin of Pluto in terms of its size and probably its composition. The polar cap you see there is frozen nitrogen because it's minus 233 degrees centigrade. And the black streaks you see are in fact the deposit of active geysers erupting at 40 degrees above absolute zero. So time after time, we, no matter how smart we thought we were getting, we still had more surprises. 
So that was a quick summary, uh, especially for the students here, for whom all of this is history. And it's just in their books. For us, some of us at least, this is what we lived. So there, a new view of the solar system really it has emerged. Uh, the remarkable diversity of bodies of the solar system, the fact that every one of the dozens of moons are distinctive bodies, having had distinctive geologic histories. Uh, it's really quite a remarkable uh, solar system. And you can imagine what it must be like with all the other planetary systems which are now being discovered, none of which look anything like, like this. But what's else? what else is there besides the planets? There is what's called the heliosphere, a giant bubble the sun creates around itself. Uh, and uh, the interstellar journey uh, was a journey to leave the bubble of solar plasma uh, and enter interstellar space. Uh, when we started this, was this was part of the original objective of the mission back in 1972 when we started. Uh, but none of us, no one knew how big the bubble was, and certainly no one knew that any spacecraft could last 36 years. So we had no idea, only a hope, that uh, nature would cooperate and give us a heliosphere that wasn't too big, and uh, we would get lucky and have a spacecraft that didn't have a catastrophic failure. And so far, everything has worked out as well as one could hope. So here is what creates that bubble. This is from the Soho mission. The Roger Bonnet had a lot to do with uh, putting in place many years ago, and it's still returning wonderful data. Nice thing about Soho, which of course we didn't have at the time, in fact, uh, but we did know about coronal mass ejections, those large eruptions that you see. But this, what was an atom moving radially inward becomes an ion. And something which was an ion moving in this direction becomes an atom. And that charge exchange creates a wall of hydrogen which piles up in front of the heliosphere. So this, is the, this was not in Parker's model law. He didn't think about the fact that the presence of neutrons doesn't just gradually slow down. It doesn't slow down at all until it goes into a, a jump. And that's essentially what's happening in the solar wind. The supersonic here it goes through a termination shock of the supersonic wind into the helio sheath. And once it's in the helio sheath, it can turn and go down the drain, which for the heliosphere is the tail. So you can see it in your own sink, in many sinks. Now what's out there? What's outside? What's outside is, it, is, this, uh, is what is the result of a supernovae uh, exploding 5, 10, 15 million years ago. The large association of giant stars, the OB association, they all, the giant stars have very limited lifetimes and they blow up and most of what their mass ends up back out in interstellar space and because there was a whole series of these, they tend to accumulate and create these large structures, bubbles if you like, or clouds. And one of these, which was the result of this activity five, ten year, million years ago, uh, created a cloud, a dense cloud, a cold cloud, uh, which just, at least some estimates suggest, just uh, just enveloped the heliosphere on the order of 100,000 years ago, which is really a remarkably short time, uh, astronomically speaking. And the, and the net effect of the combination of the sun's relative motion uh, compared to the surroundings and the motion of the cloud means that the uh, apparent direction of the wind uh, that, we're, that, uh, that the, heliosphere, the interstellar wind is from this direction, it's coming in this direction like I'm drawing. And you'll notice it appears as though it's coming from the direction of the, sort of the galactic center. If you look up at the sky where the galactic center is, that's the direction the local wind is coming. But it's not coming, of course, from the galactic center. That's just the direction in the sky. Um, and this, of course, is an artist's re rendition of uh, some UV absorption uh, data which, uh, which has been uh, acquired over many years. So here's, going back to the, uh, the MHD model, uh, this is where Voyager 1 is headed. As I said, it's headed up out of the plane. Notice the scale. It's in astronomical units. The Earth's at one astronomical unit from the Sun. So on this scale, uh, the Earth is essentially that little dot. Uh, this thing is immense. And Neptune would be about there. It's at 30, because this is 90-some AU, just to get to the termination shock. And now we know that the heliopause is 122 AU. So this is a very, it's a giant bubble, uh, but fortunately it's not 
a lot bigger, otherwise uh, we wouldn't be getting out while we still have electrical power. Now what we thought we would be seeing with Voyager 1 is once we cross inside the termination shock, the speed is radial. It's basically the same as it was at 1 AU. It has slowed down a bit because it gets loaded up with some of these hydrogen atoms from the interstellar space, which when they become ionized, they're loaded up a bit. So it slows down maybe about 300 kilometers per second, and then the shock. And it drops a factor of two, two and a half, uh, and is subsonic, and begins to turn. And so we expected to see, as we progressed through the heliosheath between the termination shock and the heliopause, a wind which was turning to go down the tail. And then Voyager 1, as I say, unfortunately, we don't have a working plasma instrument, so we had to rely on a low energy charged particle instrument, which had this stepper on it and could look to see by looking at the Compton getting effect. That is, when you're looking into the wind, you see more particles than when you look away from the wind. And in fact, the ratio between the two tells you the speed of the wind. And so it was possible using that technique to actually infer what the plasma speed was. And, and this is what was found. It was slowing down. The radio speed was just slowing down. And in fact, by we crossed the termination shock back here at the end of 2004, and the speed just sort of declined down, down, down. And finally, in April of 2010, essentially no radio outflow at all. And for a while, it looked, in fact, it was actually negative, radio, the inward. So we call this region a quasi-stagnation region because there really isn't much speed in any direction, 20 kilometer per second kinds of numbers instead of 100 kilometers per second or more uh, in this region. And uh, that, and that, of course, indicated to us we must be getting close to the boundary. Uh, why else would the wind be sort of just sitting there and not moving in any reasonable direct, any reasonable speed? So uh, we didn't. We don't know that this is an, uh, uh, that this layer is everywhere. All, that, all we know is that it's in the region the north, 35 degrees where Voyager 1 uh, has been. And the inner edge of that uh, stag quasi-stagnation region is about 113 AU. So we begin to look, are there any other signatures that we are getting close to the heliopause, which is this region right here. Outside is the interstellar space. Uh, so uh, there is, uh, there are a lot of galactic cosmic rays outside. Uh, galactic cosmic rays are, when these supernova blow up, their shocks basically accelerate some of the material that's in the local interstellar medium. Uh, and, uh, and if the speed is more than, say, 50% of the speed of light, they can actually get into 1 AU, and they were discovered, of course, over 100 years ago now. But the slower ones, those with less than on the order of 40 or 50 percent the speed of light, which is still pretty fast, can't get in uh, very efficiently because of this constant uh, outward uh, convection of the wind, the solar wind, carrying the magnetic field that scatters the cosmic rays. So we expected, as this cartoon suggests, that uh, the that cosmic rays would diffuse, diffuse in into sort of a skin depth effect. Of, further you are inside, the fewer the particles you'd see, uh, and that's essentially what we had been seeing. These are, these are logarithmic scales, uh, and this is the hydrogen, cosmic ray hydrogen, uh, the top one, the big H, if I can find my arrow, where did it go? Hmm. There it is, okay. This is hydrogen, it's a couple hundred MeV per nucleon. These are the ones that can get into 1AU. Uh, and you can see that there was a steady growth over a period of seven years of 7% 7 per year. Certainly consistent with the idea that we are approaching uh, interstellar space, but of course since we don't know how much is out there, it's hard to know to predict when we're going to get there just you looking at a curve like this. Same way with helium, it was going up 13% per year. And the electrons, which are most easily scattered by what's going on inside and therefore have the smallest skin depth of penetration, uh, were going up at 62% per year. Uh, and that had been going on since we crossed the termination shock in uh, December of 2004. And this was uh, all the way through December of 2011, uh, seven years of steady increase. Uh, and, but as I say, it was hard to predict given this slope, when we were going to be there, because we, until we got there, we didn't know how much was outside. Uh, the other signature 
uh, was the particles inside, which are accelerated at the termination shock. Just as the supernovae shocks accelerate galactic cosmic rays, our little termination shock can also accelerate particles. And when we crossed the shock, we saw this region uh, downstream of the shock uh, filled with these low energy uh, ions. Uh, and we felt that once we got close to the boundary, uh, the part, those with ions would start leaking out. Uh, they don't have a lot of mobility, so they, they really don't have much uh, gradient until you get close to the boundary. And then once you cross the boundary, space is so huge, they're gone. Uh, and the intensity just drops basically to zero. So that was the other signature we were looking for. What's, what's happening to the particles inside, the lower energy ones? They're about an MeV. Uh, so they're much, uh, uh, much slower, about 5% of the speed of light than the galactic cosmic rays. So here is the, from the uh, low energy charge particle instrument, the counting rate of MEV particles. Uh, you can see the year up here, Dece there's December 2004 when Voyager 1 crossed the termination shock. Here's the intensity of the ions that jumped up at the shock. Notice how steady they were. They varied a bit, but really remarkably steady for seven years. Uh, Voyager 2 is following along behind. It found the shock in 2007, and again, it jumped up at the shock. And notice how similar the counting rates are, even though these two spacecraft are 180, more than 180 U apart. Uh, so it, it means the process producing these particles is very similar uh, in these two different regions of, of, the, of the termination shock. So again, that's what we've been seeing. There was some suggestion, as you can see, uh, from the Voyager 1 data that the intensity may be starting to decline. On the other hand, it also is declining at Voyager 2, which isn't as close to the boundary. So that's probably not a boundary effect. It's just an overall temporal variation. So that was the, that was the situation the first part of 2012. And, but we were beginning, we were clearly looking at our data uh, very, every day uh, because we all felt it had to be not too far away, although I couldn't tell you how far that was. Uh, so here's the counting rate of MEV particles. These, this particular plot's from the CRS, but the LACP has exactly the same kind of data. Uh, and there's May of 20, 2012, no decrease in May. Uh, June, su suggestion, maybe something is happening. Whoop, sorry, no mind. Press the wrong button. Back, back, back. Okay, so we. There's June, there's July, so, and there's July 28th. Suddenly, it dropped to factor two in one, just basically in, in an hour or two. Um, and five days later, it was back to what it had been. And then another one, this time uh, in August 13th, we were clearly getting close to something uh, and again, it recovered after a few after seven days, and then on August 25th, it went to essentially zero, and that's where it's been ever since. Certainly sounds, from a particle point of view, that we crossed the terminal, we crossed the heliopause. But uh, we have other data which uh, which uh, basically meant we could not really make that conclusion as cleanly as uh, it appears here. Now, the other part of the story, besides the fact that these are the inside ions, which behaved exactly like we expected. Once we cross this boundary, they're gone. Uh, and what happened to the galactic cosmic rays? You notice that every time the inside particles dropped, I can find my arrow again. I don't know where it is. There it is. There, this first drop, that's when the galactic cosmic rays jumped up. And when the inside temperature, the intensity came back up, the galactic cosmic rays went down. Another drop out, cosmic rays went up. And the final drop up, cosmic rays went up and have stayed up again ever since. Exactly what we expected. So what, and, but of course, the, the, these particles are, are really reacting to the environment. They're not creating the environment. The environment is being created by the plasma which we can't measure. So what do we, and the plasma inside is, as it says here, about 10 to the minus three per cubic centimeter. 
Outside, it's 10 to the minus 1. It's a factor of 100 different in plasma density. Uh, so since we didn't have a plasma instrument, we used a proxy. And the proxy is the magnetic field which is carried by the plasma. The solar plasma carries the solar magnetic field, and the interstellar plasma carries the galactic magnetic field. And so we felt we could use the magnetic field as a proxy to tell us or confirm that in fact we actually had left. We had moved from one kind of plasma to the other, and we would have seen a change in the direction of the magnetic field. So here's, again, this is that same plot showing the, the energetic uh, inside particles dropping uh, two times and then in August 25th dropping and staying down. And this is what the magnetic field looked like. On the very time that the particles were dropping, the magnetic field jumped up uh, significantly. Uh, and then when the particles came back, the field went back down. So that part of the story looked quite promising. That in fact, the field was showing an increase exactly the times when the particle, the positive rays were showing an increase and when the low energy inside particles were disappearing. So we looked at the direction of the magnetic field. And there should, according to models, be a different direction. Inside, the magnetic field from the sun is carried out by the solar wind. And because the sun is rotating, the field is wrapped into a huge Archimedean spiral. So the field has been east-west, essentially, uh, for the last 30 years on Voyager. Uh, and so that's one indication. The field inside, we thought, should be mainly east-west. The magnetic field outside is from the galaxy, and the missions like IBEX and other data all suggest the field will be not north-south, but more, more northerly than southerly than east-west, that there should be some difference. And to quantify that, uh, I, I will show you what the models indicate. So here's looking out from the Earth. North is up. The T or the, is the tangential direction. Um, and as I say, the solar magnetic field will be in the T direction, plus or minus. We don't, I mean, that depends on polarity. Uh, and there's what we're measured before we cross those boundaries. More or less azimuthal, east-west, uh, and about two microgauss, two tesla nanos. This is what the model, one model, said the interstellar field would look like when it gets wrapped around the outside of the heliosphere. Uh, so it'd be different by some 20, 30 degrees. What did we see? No change at all in direction, just in intensity. This magnetic pressure went up a factor of three, but the direction did not change. And so we were unable to argue that we had actually left the solar field. It certainly looked like we were still on the solar field. And uh, so this is the cartoon that we put together. So here's the, uh, if you just, these, these are the magnetic field lines that you can see, spiral field lines. Here's the termination shock. This is where the, when you slow down the plasma, the field gets stronger, so the field lines are closer together, as shown in this region. This is where the, the solar wind is slowing down, uh, starting at the termination shock. The solar wind slows down. And here's where the wind is basically no longer moving in a sensible way. The field was stronger there yet because it was sort of piling up. And then we crossed into this new region, which we call the depletion region, because it was depleted of all the inside particles. Uh, and it was, had to be connected to the outside because the particles had left and the particles outside had come in. So we sort of so that's some kind of a magnetic highway where the inside particles can get out and outside particles can get in, but it appeared to be still the solar magnetic field. So that meant the heliopause, the plasma boundary, was still ahead of us. Well, the, the uh, one, thing that, one thing that saved us was a bit of luck. Uh, that is, the, as this plot, as this MHD model shows, what happens is that the solar wind plasma, as it moves out into the solar system, gets cooler. The colors here are temperature, so it cools off as it moves out, gets thinner and thinner. Uh, then there's a, the shock, it gets uh, thicker and hotter. Uh, and if you plot the density of the solar wind as a function of distance, here's the Earth, here's where uh, uh, Saturn is, and your, uh, Neptune's about here on this scale, uh, the, the plasma density falls off like 1 over r squared until we get to the shock, and there's a small jump because of the shock, uh, and then at the heliopause, uh, the 
It's much colder, and therefore for pressure balance, it has to be denser, a factor of 100 denser. So that's what we uh, ho had hoped to measure. And we got lucky. That is, although we can't measure the plasma, we can measure any oscillations, any waves in the plasma. It takes, though, a blast wave from the sun to cause the plasma to generate these waves. And the sun has been remarkably uncooperative in terms of major events. If we look, if we, this goes back to 1982-83, uh, this is the counting rate of the neutron monitor, which is the energy cause of rays that get into Earth. And you can see that when the sun occasionally has major eruptions, it can cause a big dip in the counting rate of the neutron monitor. There's one such dip. 11 years later, solar activity, there was another big one. And uh, not so big one, but somewhat sized one back uh, in the 2000s, early 2000s. But very little since then. And what uh, Gurnett et al. discovered was that about 400 days after this major eruption on the sun, there would be a burst of radio waves coming from out there. Uh, and the frequency of these radio waves was kilohertz. And since the plasma wave, plasma frequency related to the density, uh, uh, they argued that these, wave, these radio waves had to be coming from interstellar space. Uh, and you can see there, they come in 11-year episodes because it takes really massive solar ejections to cause uh, this, uh, to cause the plasma to oscillate out in uh, interstellar space. So we had had no si no signals at all from this instrument in seven years, and but fortunately in March of 2012 there was a large enough eruption on the sun headed toward the Voyager's direction that 400 days later. You can hear this. Oh, sorry. There we go. So these are the sounds of interstellar space. This that whistling sound is a discrete frequency. It's square. The frequency is nine kilohertz times the square root of n per cubic centimeter. This was 100 times the density of the solar wind. It was exactly what we had thought interstellar meeting would be. So, and there were two such episodes. As you can see, there was a gradient in the density uh, because there was this earlier episode in the late last year uh, and this then the recent one in April, May of this year, which was a higher frequency and a higher density. Uh, so we are in the region where the plasma is piling up outside the heliopause. And if you extrapolate that dashed line back, uh, it says August 25th. Uh, it's a good date for having left the heliosphere. So the energetic particle signatures were in fact telling us that we could not show that in fact the plasma had in fact changed. This made it very clear. We are in the plasma density, 100 times that of the sun, and it's hard to imagine we're still inside the heliosphere, although I think uh, there are some theorists who are really suggesting maybe there is a way to do it. So we'll see. The story may still be more complicated, but I think most of us believe that, uh, that this is a density of interstellar space. So here's the cartoon now. Uh, changed from what we had before. Here's the termination shock. The small dots you see represent the inside energetic particles, which as you can see are gone outside. And what's outside now, uh, we've made a similar color to in the Hubble image just to because that's essentially the region we're in. We're in the region where the plasma is piling up in front of the view sphere and would have, would have a, a slight glow to it. Now you have to remember, this is a better vacuum than anything here on Earth. So. Uh, uh, it's not, uh, not going to affect uh, the spacecraft and so it's really not going to be visible to us. Uh, Voyager 1 now is 125 astronomical units uh, out, 18.8 uh, billion miles. It travels, three point, it travels one astronomical unit every 100 days, a uh, million miles per day. Really quite, it's the fastest thing leaving the solar system. Uh, Voyager 2 is trailing along behind. It's so much slower. Uh, it's 102 AU, uh, and, uh, but it, it's, it's still moving along pretty well. 
Voyager 1 now will be exploring this region, I put a white circle just to indicate it. It's the region about that scale, before, you know, that's about how much more time we have. So we will be looking at the interaction uh, where the, the plasma is outside is being deflected uh, and interacting with the hydrogen to create the hydrogen wall. So there will be, we expect there will be significant gradients uh, that uh, will, will really inform us about the physics of this interaction. The Voyager 2 is still inside. Uh, my guess is probably another three or four years, but none of us know. Uh, we'll find out. It's clearly going in a different direction. Unlike Voyager 1, where we saw the speed slowing down, this speed has not slowed down. It has just turned exactly like the models say it should, without slowing down. So, already, or we already know that there's something that's radically different down south, uh, and it's more like the models. Uh, than, uh, than uh, what's the Voyager 1. The first instrument, we have enough electrical power that we can run all of our instruments on Voyager until 2020. And we we'll keep turning things off, we won't use the gyros anymore, but the, the sled is surely shutting things down. But at some point, there's a minimum requirement to, to run the spacecraft, and what's left, you can run the instruments. Uh, and in 2020, we'll have to turn off the first instrument. And as the power decays, continuing uh, by 2025, we'll have to turn off the last one. Now, there may be some tricks one can play, but roughly first order, we have roughly another 10 years now on a new mission to explore interstellar space. So welcome to interstellar space. Thank you. And uh, we have microphones and people have some questions. If the observation proof the diagram of after uh, Helios, uh, Helios fail pulse and uh, the shock wave region. If the uh, your, your uh, voyage uh, space observation proof the diagram of the helium pulse structure and the shock wave? We don't know if there's a bow shock out in front uh, directly. I think the, the field is quite strong, and that means the alphane velocity out there is fairly high. So uh, that, so, and we know the speed is only 23 kilometers per second, so there is an argument going on as to whether there's any shock at all. But the plasma still has to be deflected as shown in these plots, even if there's not a shock. And that's one of the wonderful lecture. By this lecture only, you would deserve the award that you received. Uh, <laughs> but you did so many more things. So, since you do a lot of things, I would like to know, if you had to do it again, tomorrow, what would you change? Of course, going faster. <laughs> yeah, going faster would clearly be a big else? Well, we don't, uh, and one which could look not only for this core solar plasma, but the pickup ions, because these neutral atoms which come in get ionized and they become part of the solar wind, but they have a distinct signature because they have a, this kind of motion around the field. And modern instruments can actually measure that, and that's a very important part of the plasma. That's probably where most of the energy goes, that the shock is in those particles. We can't measure any of those on Voyager 2 either. So, so much better plasma measurements. A measure of neutral atoms. I mean, the IBEX measures them here at Earth, but it would be good to measure them out there. And so again, uh, some kind of a, a, a neutral atom. Pla uh, dust is a, a, another important part of what's going on out there. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and of course, one could have a much better uh, radio plasma wave instrument than we have. This, this little instrument only weighed a couple of kilograms. It takes 35 years to get there, so it's old. Yes, more questions. Can you tell me the situation of the nuclear missile? Could you speak up? It's, it's hard. It's, it's just some... The situation of the RTG. RTG. What about the RTG? The situation. Oh, they're working fine. That's, as I say, the, the power declines about four, four watts a year to decay. Yeah, so it's, it's a very a normal thing. 88-year half-life, that's part of the reason the spacecraft is still going so well. So what, what do the Voyager 1 and 2 bomb 
uh, the variation of the mass density and the change of mass density. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, mass density, uh, the change of mass density uh, in our uh, stellar. Uh, the mass density? Uh, mass density uh, in the solar in the solar system and uh, out of the solar system. Well, I think uh, what is the wider electron density is about 0.08, and that's going to be mainly matched by protons. Uh, so we have at the first order about a tenth of a proton per cubic centimeter. That's the that's the density. That's the density. Okay. okay. Yep. Why why is the wider not uh, be destroyed by by some by anything? Space <laughs> is empty. <laughs> really, space is empty. You have to work hard get to get close to anything. <laughs> that's lucky. You know, that's one of, the, one of the reasons that Pioneer 10 and 11 were sent before Voyager was it was not clear that a spacecraft could get through the asteroid belt. Well, it turns out, yeah, there's an asteroid belt, but there's not a lot, there's not hardly any small stuff associated with it, so it's empty. Uh, the risky targets for risky things for Voyager were the irradiation environment at Jupiter, which was horrendous, and we had to it took nine months off to fix everything so it would survive it, and the Saturn ring plane. Uh, and again, a Pioneer 11 took, went through the ring plane where Voyager had to go through it to go on the Earth. So we felt we had done the due diligence, it was safe to fly by there, but you could easily run the spacecraft into the rings and that'd be the end. <laughs> so, but, it's, but those, that's because we were trying to get close to them. If you don't try to get close to them, uh, it's empty, space is empty. Got lots of plasma and dust and uh, typical animals now from it. Um, we didn't have enough power, so we turned off the heater and it dropped to below minus 80. We can't tell you how cold it is because it was never calibrated for such a low temperature. It was never operated, but it still operates. Um, so we will continue to turn off the heaters. We can't turn some of them off because it freeze the hydrogen line and that's it. Then you don't have any propulsion. So there's a certain minimum temperature we have to maintain. But we can just let the temp thing, just, that's part of, you know, conserving, I mean, reducing the power is where we turn things off one by one, but by 2020, we'll have to turn off an instrument. Um, we're currently in interstellar space with Voyager. Well, how um, far do Voyager uh, 2 can go? Because you said it's 150, 170 astronomy units for Voyager 1, so how far is it for Voyager 2? Yeah, Voyager, Voyager, Voyager 2 is, but it'll be maybe 100 and the exact numbers, but it's something like that. Okay, thank you.